Welcome to class four. If you're confused about anything that we're talking about today, this class is intertwined with the last class, as all of them are. And uh, you're, you will need to review some of that information if you find yourself getting lost. I'll put a link in the description to class three, two, and one. Class 3 is the one that you absolutely need to have to understand what we're doing here. Something has changed this year that will affect the next 15 years and I'm going to give information out to try to get the most of you in the field as quickly as possible so that you can find some life-changing goal. We're looking for big nuggets. The kind that sell for $75,000 and up today. That's what we're after. And what has happened? Well, we've had a severe winter. The deposits that you saw me working and some of the, the fantastic finds you see other people making on television actually happened from an event in 1991. So with this weather event that we're having now, it's going to replenish the gold fields. It's going to move everything back around and now you have a shot at it. The most productive large gold redeposits that the most people will have a shot at, at getting to and, uh, and working with minimal equipment, you know, with minimal expense, are in the desert. And that's going to be by eyesight or with metal detectors. So we're going to concentrate on that. Uh, Arizona, California, Nevada, prime places to go. But don't forget, if you're in the eastern states or you can pull up the, the dredged areas in Idaho, Oregon, you know, other states, the tops of those piles where they pile their dredged materials are now renewed and they're open to detecting because in, in most cases anything that was larger than a quarter inch or an eighth inch went out on the pile and there is some huge gold in those areas. Let's take a look at the desert and the areas you should target and some of the special situations you'll see and what you can do. Now in our last class we went through a lot of theory and practical applications as well. But we were talking a lot about how your large gold in a bar will filter through round rock riverbed gravel which is round and your smaller gold will tend to uh, be on top. Now in the desert the reverse is true. The largest gold nuggets are found shallow and this is why all of us have a shot in the desert. The rules are reversed out in the desert and that's because the soil is angular. You have these angular rocks and they kind of interlock so not only a little small teeny tiny piece of gold goes down deep where your big gold due to the alkali salts they kind of act as a uh, concretion as they cook out every year when the soil gets a little damp and then they cook out gets damp the next year cooks out it forms like a concrete highway and remember this as gold is scooting along the desert highway a pothole even a small one is a pocket and you know the effect of a uh, highway on the side of a mountain when gravels come down, they go right across it. Well, that's the desert for you. Anyone who's dug in the desert, and you've seen me doing it, and you hear that clink, uh, you come to a certain point, it's generally about six, eight inches down, solid. And you have to get through that area to get down to the softer material below. Well, our big gold nuggets are going to be riding right across that, and that's why you're going to have a shot, no matter what kind of metal detector you have, in the desert. I'm not talking about 
uh, Australia now where you have ironstone. That's a totally different situation. We're out in the American desert. Things are relatively easy. We do have hot rocks and iron pieces out in there and things like that. But your biggest gold is generally found up near the surface. Now let's look at the mountain top. From the mountain top you have weathering action. It can be wind, it can be water. And you get your Bahada plaster. Those are your classic side plasters that you can find by eyesight gold simply by walking along there. You're going to have to climb up there because it's generally some steep terrain to get to them. But these are where really big discoveries can be made. And there's a second area that you can discover huge nuggets. And that's down in this pediment area. And what this is, is the weathering action of this mountain is going back over thousands of years and it's exposing its own bedrock down here at the bottom. Welcome to the Marinci Mine, Arizona. Now this is a NASA Astra image and we can use these images to find the pediment areas in the mountains. All you're going to take do is take one of the NASA images, throw it into your browser or onto your desktop and open it up in your picture mode and then you're going to start zooming in and checking these areas for a pediment where the mountain has receded back and left a flat area. Usually they're all one color. And you're going to target, have at least three of those places targeted for your trip so that if anyone doesn't work out is one you know if you get on claim ground or something like that you have a backup someplace else to go the soil is generally very rocky if there is anything at all because all this stream that all this water is coming streaming off the mountain and it hits this angle whoosh and it it just flushes it the only thing that is possible to stick here is gold. And you want to be right up in here in this, in this area, right next to the mountain, if you're hunting by eyesight or if you've got a, a Jeep in low range first gear and you're just creepy crawling along looking or an ATV or something like that. This is a little area that you want to look for by eyesight. Here we have Death Valley looking north, massive quartz, and right in here, see how this face has eroded back? We have our pediment. This is the mountain pass area of California, and you see how these have eroded back almost straight down into a pediment, this area right in here. Now let's cover metal detecting. What areas do we want to detect? Well, we have the pediment area coming off from the mountain and this will wash down into a gully. Gullies are generally V-shaped and from our last class we know they're, they're hard to walk in. Uh, but the sides of these gullies are frequently all the way down to bedrock. These are really, really good places to look if you can get into the gully. Now the gully is hard to get into, it's hard to get out of, so you got to be in pretty good shape. Gullies form gulches, and a gulch can be a half mile wide. They're generally U-shaped, and this gives you a much wider area. Many times this will go all the way down to a bedrock area, and within the gulches is where you find your little pockets. And pockets can be extremely rich with gold. Now, the gulches will form gulch, gulch, gulch. You know, many gulches form a wash. And a wash can be miles wide. And this is generalized ground. Um, and it's 
blowing out over again that asphalt highway underneath it. And this is where you find all sizes of gum. Okay, you can be, but generally, since this is angular material, your bigger gold is still on top. Uh, your smaller gold filters down between and it's down deeper. Now, how do I set up my metal detector? What metal detector do I want to use? Well, you want to use the metal detector that you're familiar with uh, first and foremost, no matter what that is. And what you want to practice with and you want to know all about is a nickel. You want to know, you want to detect a nickel. If you're in the east, you want to bury this nickel and find out how deep you can detect it. When you get out west, from my experience anyway, uh, your detection depth is going to be half of what you found in the east because of the difficulty of the soil, the, the iron sands, and that sort of thing. You want to take your nickel, you want to bury, find out how far you can find it flat. Find out how far you can find it on the edge. Bury it again and find out all these things. So you've got a good idea of what, not only whether you can find a nugget, but what depth that nugget would be at, what the sound is. And you're going to take this nickel, a pre-1975 nickel, we want a good nickel, you're going to take that with you out west. So that you, you know, anytime you're getting a signal, you can kind of remind yourself what it sounds like. Now another tactic you can use beyond the nickel if you've got a, a basic machine is go to the lead weight concept that we did in the last film and find out you know if you've got a, a, a flea market special or something like that that you picked up and you found out in the, in the last movie that we can find gold with those things find out what size lead weight, don't flatten it, don't do any of the stuff they tell you to do. Just find out the weight that you've got that it'll find. That's the size gold you're looking for. So, you know, easy peasy, we've all got a shot that way. The main thing is we got to get out there and be first. We want our coil to be first going across these huge areas. Now, what do you do about claims when you're there? If you see a bottle with a piece of paper with it, if you see claim markers, 90% of the West is not claimed. And you go to, to the map, to the piece of paper that, that there is, you find out the date. Is the claim still valid? Is it, is it valid? Is it, if it is valid, you're going to go right around the edge of that, you don't detect on somebody's claim. They're, they have the right to the minerals on that piece of property. If there's minerals on that piece of property, there's minerals on all the surrounding pieces of property. So, if you find, generally in the middle of the claim, there's going to be a claim marker with a jar, a jug, you know, some kind of piece of paper will be inside it giving you the boundaries of the claim, the dates of the claim, and uh, in 90% of the cases these claims have gone back to the government. They're, they're no longer valid. What are some other situations I might see in the desert? Well, areas that you might want to detect that you'll come across are the old dry washing areas. Now in the dry washing areas you're going to see two piles. The dry washer went in between and the dry washer is simply a, a stream type, type of uh, riffle system reversed where it now catches material as it's being bumped either by air or some mechanical means and it's bump 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 and the material is coming down and it's catching nuggets. It's a pretty sometimes inefficient system but they used it a lot. It's all they had to use out in the desert. Now this big pile here 
is going to have gold in it that was bumped out of the dry washer. This little small pile back here is the raw shovelings that they put into the dry washer. It is not checked or has not been checked for anything unless somebody else with a metal detector checked it. And now that we've, we're having these immense rains, all of this stuff is getting beaten down and the gold is, it could be anywhere in this pile, but a lot of it's going to be on top because the lighter stuff is going to slough away. So, of the two piles, you want to check this one first. Now, if you're an experienced person, you know, what should I use? Well, if you're using any of the higher-end machines, kilohertz-wise, you know, you've got a, you got a gold bug, you've got a, uh, a White's Gold Master 60 kilohertz plus. Uh, those machines with their coils with the White's, I would be using a 5-inch coil with the... Uh, Fisher, just the stock coil is fine because the, the high kilohertz of those things, uh, they'll find a, you know, a flake sized, a little bit bigger than a flake of gold. They'll beep on it and you get that zip, and that's the sound you want to be looking for. But especially if you're from the east, you don't want to get hung up looking for little teeny tiny bits of gold that these things will find. It's pretty silly to go, you know, drive 3,000 miles to find a flake of gold. Why, and why did you do that? Unless you've got a uh, front end loader to load the, you know, to load the dump truck of all the stuff. So we're looking for big gold now. And you would take your coil, flip it over, Try to figure out how big it is, or your pinpoint, or whatever you got. And, uh, you know, we're looking for the bigger stuff, not the smaller stuff. Um, a perennial favorite of mine has been the MXT for years. And there's a way to set that up uh, that I'd recommend for the, this situation that we're going into here. And I'll show you how to do it. Alright, if you've got an MXT, either one of the models... What you're want to, going to want to do is keep your sat as low as you can. You're going to flip this into prospecting. You're going to take your gain, turn it on. You're going to come around here to plus one, plus two, plus three. You're going to turn the gain as high as you can. All right. And how I like to set it up when I'm out prospecting is I put it in the relic mode. And now I'm going to have a low high tone. Anything that's non-ferrous is going to sound off with a high tone. Anything ferrous is going to be a low tone. I get a hit, right back into the prospecting mode. I scan it, find out whether, you know, is it probability of iron 10% to 40%. Uh, you know, that, and then I make my determination on what it is. Flip the coil over, try to figure out a size, or take my pinpoint, whatever I got, you know, I'm going from there. So just a quick down and dirty tip for you. The relic mode will give you a low high tone, save you a lot of consternation out in the field. Now while you're out in the desert, sooner or later you're going to see this. You're going to come across these lines. You say, what the, what the heck is that all about? Well, those are traverse lines. That's where somebody has made a grid system. And they're walking along this line, turning, coming back. And very carefully, they're going to get the, whatever is in that area. And then they're going to come back and they're going to do the next block. These are how the, that's how the professionals do it. And you're likely to see some of that going on if you're out there paying attention. That's the way you, you really know that you have covered an area. You don't want to be, you know, running with your metal detector. Uh, you want to cover the ground thoroughly that you're on. You're going to make some decisions based 
on the last class that we had, maybe the first class that we had, on the, the area that you want to target, and you're going to work that ground thoroughly. And you're going to keep going back, you're going to know it from year to year, and cover this area, cover the next area, cover the next area. It's important for you to, to get out there as quick as you can though, especially this year, because this is the first year the ground has been uncovered. And you, you can make a major discovery. All right, now where are the specific locations that, that I go? Well, why don't we let the professionals tell us that? Muriel Sybil Wohl. Now, who is she and why is she important to you? Muriel Sybil Wohl is probably the greatest prospector that ever lived, though I don't think she ever found a single piece of gold. But she traveled many, many thousands of miles through the West and led a, a lot of us to gold with her um, descriptions. She was active in the middle part of the last century, and what she would do is she would go into ghost towns in her old jalopy and uh, interview people who were active at the time, who had been there, who had seen it, who knew where strikes were made. And she was a school teacher herself. She was a professor and an artist. And anytime you can grab one of her books, you need to do so. Now these are my notes from one of her books back in the day that uh, led us to gold. And I would revisit some of these areas, especially in, in this, these areas in New Mexico. I'm going to read just a brief passage so you can get an idea of her writing style and, and why this is so important to you. In 1839, some prospector found rich deposits in the San Pedro Mountain on Lazarus Gulch and in the tributaries of Tuerto Creek. We go on to say that they were mining this with wooden bowls. And pockets of gold are still found at bedrock, especially after heavy rains have washed fresh gravel from the stream bed. Right now, this is the area that Mrs. Wohl is describing to you. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull up, or what you're going to do, I'm not going to do all this for you. You're going to pull up your topo map, and then you're going to look for Tuerto Creek, Lazarus Gulch, all these areas in here, all the little side feeder creeks. And from there, you're going to pull up your satellite photo imagery. And you're going to look at it with that, and you're going to make a determination what will get you the closest to bedrock on the side hills or in the gulch or gully itself, whatever you're going for. You're going to take your mineral map, pull that up. You already know gold is here, so you might not have to do that. But you can take your USGS mineral maps. You can look at those and... Uh, you're going to pick out a few different places in here to go in case one bombs out. You've, got, you've already got another one spied, and this is how you do it. You're hunting for big gold in these gullies, gulches, and washes. You have other things available to you for virtually nothing simply by going down to your used... Uh, Bookstore and looking for these magazines, Frontier Times, 1925. These are all first-person accounts which uh, take you right to points of discovery. In general, you want to get magazines that were before the uh, 1965, before the age of metal detectors, because they had thought that everything was mined out. And they had no concept of the power of uh, some of the technology of today. Also useful to you are professional papers. Now this is House Document, Volume 72, Geological Survey Professional Papers, 
54 and 55 from the 59th Congress of the United States. First session, 1905-1906. And what's in these old books? Well, they will show you exactly where the gold veins are located. This is, these are running north and south. Remember, we said that the gold veins will run north and south. Rivers run east and west and where they cross. They carry the, the gold down and that's why 90% of the gold has never been found. It's only the small percentage where the rivers cross that we know about. Or where they have tunneled into mountains and found gold as a result of a river crossing these veins and they, then they go up and they find out where the source is and start tunneling. But they will tell you where the gold veins are, where the dikes are, volcanic activity, where the uh, gems would be. Now they were interested primarily in just the gold, so all the gems and all the other stuff went out on the tailings piles. All the discoveries are in the Library of Congress books and they're online. You can get these things for a mere pittance now. And if you really like to metal detect for other things, you can get important clues as to where the old town sites were and where the old tent cities were. Because before any town, there was a tent city. And remember the medium of the day, the medium of, of exchange was gold silver dollars. One thing to remember, your richest gold veins are either in the mountain or right alongside the mountain and they're running north-south. Can't stress that enough. North-south. Veinlets will branch off and go east-west. So if you come across a rich veinlet, just a little thin line of vein running east-west, you want to go toward the mountain. And in 99.99% .99 of the time, this is where your major vein lies, toward the mountain base. As many of you know, I have had a stroke. And if there's anything from these last 20 years of teaching that, that you find valuable to you. Now's the time to put it on a key, put it on a disk, put it on a zip file, you know, whatever you do, we feel, Connie and I feel fine, but uh, you know, you never know. Uh, if there's something that you want, I would definitely download it at this time and, uh, and save it. So good luck to you. Good luck out there in your prospecting. And I hope you find a bucket full of these big nuggets.